Hello and welcome to Wesley Methodist Church in Reading. You're very welcome to join our service today. Our service is led by the Reverend David Shaw and he is um, giving us the next in an occasional series on Acts. And today he's reached chapter 2 and we're halfway through the sermon that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost. First of all, David would lead us in prayer. We come in this season of Easter conscious of the victory that you have won, life over death, love over hate, light over darkness, hope over despair. And how can we fail to praise and thank you for your great victory in Christ, won for us by death and resurrection? We come just as we are, a motley shower, to be honest, Lord. A mixture of good things and things that we're embarrassed and ashamed about. And yet, in your grace, you accept us and welcome us here. We pray that you will build on the things that are good in our lives and transform the ugliness of our lives into something that is beautiful for you, serves your kingdom, and builds community. Take away the wrong, Lord, by that same cross. For we ask this prayer in the name of our risen Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join with me in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Oh, so 
chapter 2, verses 22 to 38. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Oh, my God.
This is some sermon. I know we've joined it part way through, but this is a record of the very first Christian sermon. And running through the text is this aspect of Trinity, for it's preached on the first Pentecost, and there is reference to the Spirit. There's a focus on the work of Jesus, and all in the heart of it, threading its way through, is the work of God the Father. I invite you as we work our way through this long sermon uh, to notice two things. To notice firstly the work of God in raising Jesus from the dead. So often as Christians we focus on the cross. We focus on what Jesus achieved on the cross. We focus on what the cross represents and symbolises. We wear crosses around our necks and on our lapels. And that is so often in the Christian narrative where we focus. But in this sermon, the focus is on resurrection. The cross is there in this first biopic of, of the life of Jesus, where Luke records, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to God, by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him, as you know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. That's where the cross comes in. But others have performed miracles. Others have been arrested and betrayed and let down and denied. Others, many, far too many, have been crucified, nailed to the cross. And then Luke uses a very important word to start the next verse. Luke says, but... And that but is important because that but reminds us that what is going to happen next is unique. That but reminds us that what happens next is the game changer. Now, I've been a cricket fan for as long as I can remember. And this will show you how long. Over 50 years ago. I can remember the Gillette Cup final between the two top county one day sides in the early 1970s. It was Lancashire, which was near where I lived at the time, and everybody used to shout, Lanky, 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 Lancashire. And the other one was a southern county, Kent. And they met in the Gillette Cup final of 1971. And Asif Iqbal, who was the Pakistani uh, overseas cricketer who was a player at Kent, was taking the game away from Lancashire. He was scoring runs at will and they were ahead of, they were ahead of the run rate. And then he hit the ball hard through extra cover, aiming for the gap between the two fielders on the boundary, assured it would pass the inner fielder only for Jackie Bond, who in cricketing terms was, in his, uh, was an elderly man, he was in his late thirties. He was a short man, he was in the infield because he couldn't really run round the boundary. He leapt to his right like a salmon and with his arm, right arm outstretched he caught the ball. The game changed in that moment. With the resurrection of Jesus, the game changed at that moment. History would never be the same. Luke writes all that stuff about the cross and then says, but God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Now, our translations 
miss two pictures that Luke uses to describe resurrection. Luke writes in the New International Version, freeing him from the agony of death. And that first image is, is characterised in our translation by the word freeing. If we were to take it literally, it would mean untying. That, that what God has done is that God has uh, untied the cords of death that were holding Jesus. Eugene Peterson in his message translation or his paraphrase puts it this way but God untied the death ropes and raised him up so the picture is this imagine in a film the hero has been caught by the baddies by the enemy and has been tied up and just left for dead and the heroine comes in and she unties the ropes or cuts them with a knife and helps the hero up so the hero can stand and live again. That's the image of freeing. And then there is the image that is even less clear for it says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. And the second image is there in the word agony. The word agony in, in Greek is often translated pangs or birth pangs. What we have here is new life coming. Howard Marshall uh, says death Cannot be, death can be regarded as being in labour and unable to hold back its child, the Messiah. Well, I don't particularly go with that. I prefer the image of God as midwife. God as the one who brings that new life into being. It's new life for Jesus... But it is new life also for all who are in him. In both those images, the freeing, the untying, and in the, um, and in the birth pangs, it is the action of God. God is the untire. God is the midwife. God is the deliverer of new life. Now Paul, uh, Peter, sorry, Peter isn't finished with resurrection. He's only just got started. And he moves on to um, a quote from Psalm 16, quoting David, the psalmist. Now it's fascinating here because the Bible passage, uh, the sermon starts with a long quote from Joel that we haven't read uh, in this service. That Peter gives no um, sermon on, no reflection, no saying you need to understand it this way. But he does with this from Psalm 16. And, and he, this is, as far as Peter is concerned, or quoted in Luke is concerned, is this is David centuries earlier looking forward to the time when his successor, God's chosen one, will receive resurrection. In fact, what Luke writes, quoting what Peter preached, is seeing what was ahead, that's David looking ahead, seeing what was ahead he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he was not to be abandoned to the grave nor did his body see decay and then this statement again God raised this Jesus to life and then Peter goes on to say something with such power he says 
and we are all witnesses to this fact and I in my head can imagine Peter just looking at the other disciples all that group of people the 120 that were in the upper room and saying we are all witnesses to that fact now the second thing remember I said at the beginning there were two things that I wanted us to draw out of this and to notice in this passage about Jesus the second is how this passage transitions it could be summarized this point by noticing how Peter starts by describing Jesus he says men of Israel listen to this Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God he ends the sermon Therefore let all Israel be assured of, of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Starts as a man and ends as the Lord, the Christ. And it's as if throughout this there is a really high Christology. For Peter goes on to say that this Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God. Amen. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. Amen. And has now poured out what we now see and hear. Amen. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Amen. This is some sermon and all of us preachers, all of us Christians need to hold together this work of God in Christ through the gift of the Spirit. This sermon was preached at Pentecost but this isn't just a Pentecost sermon. This is a sermon for all time. Amen. And now, prayer of intersection. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, throughout all of human history, your desire to abide with us and to create places of meeting has never wavered. Therefore, with hope and with confidence, we bring our prayers before you. We ask that we may be so rooted and grafted in you that we bear fruit to your glory. Nourish and tend your church that we may be strong and fit to serve this present age. We pray for the rulers and governments of people that they promote conditions where all may flourish, defending the poor and the weak, the vulnerable and those easily overlooked. We pray for those who are struggling for survival, those whose lives have collapsed around them, those who have been stripped of their dignity, those who have lost hope. We pray for those whose health has failed, whether that be of the mind, body or spirit. In a time of quiet, we remember those others who are on our hearts and minds. Lord God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we know that at the end we shall see you face to face in all your glory. In a time of quiet, we remember before you those who we have loved and who have gone before us to that place where countless angels dwell and where there is no more sorrow and no more pain and where they have heard the words of King Jesus, Come, bless of my father and receive the kingdom prepared for you amen
and now a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>